name is Chris Schrader. I teach environmental law here at the law school and am privileged to be able to introduce this event, um, as to which I've had almost no active role. This is uh, putting this event on is 99.9% uh, .9 of the work of the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Forum Editorial Board. Uh, Jonathan Weiner and I provided a little advice uh, on the edges, but it is overwhelmingly uh, the result of the energy and interest of students here at the law school and the Nicholas School of the Environment. I think they've uh, developed a, a spectacular program and group of speakers, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, the day, uh, as I'm sure you are too. I also want to, at the outset, thank um, the sponsors of the organ of the event uh, who've helped underwrite um, the expenses, and they include the uh, program on public law here at the law school, the law firm of Hogan and Hartson, the Federalist Society, the Nicholas School, Center for Environmental Solutions, the Duke Environmental Law Society, the Duke Democrats, and the Office of Student Affairs. So to all of them for chipping in and making it possible financially. Let me express my thanks to them as well. Natural resources policy, federal natural resources policy, uh, raises, as anyone who's looked in the newspapers recently, an array of significant and current controversial issues. Uh, and although some of the issues uh, have taken new turns, uh, much of the underlying tension uh, with regard to the policy disputes over these issues is a tension that's been with us for a long time. Uh, federal natural resources policy is important in part because the federal government owns approximately one-third of the nation's land, and so what the government does as land manager is in and of itself vitally important. Until the late 1800s, federal policy was fairly simple to describe. When the federal government owned land, it tried to dispose of it, uh, to, to privatize it uh, in ways that would largely encourage development, whether it be of uh, exploration for water or to build the nation's railroads or to look for minerals. That policy began to change in the late 1800s. You probably would, many people mark the, uh, the beginning of a shift or a, a, an important moment in the shift in, in the reserving the land that subsequently became Yosemite National Park. And over the years, we've continued to develop um, a policy and interest in government retention of lands, either because, like Yosemite or Yellowstone, they are thought to be national treasures, uh, or in some instances because they were thought to be barren wastelands that no one was interested in owning uh, in any event. Uh, but the ownership of land and, and the uses to which government have, has, uh, is to put it uh, have, uh, has continued to be uh, a source of ongoing discussion and debate. And we've developed an array of legislative statutory law to cope with either general or specific uh, policy issues in the resolution of that question, how lands are to be used. Uh, particularly during the active period of the uh, late 60s and through to the mid-70s, the Congress enacted a number of statutes uh, affecting public lands uses, uh, which either encourage multiple use or point in the direction of conservation and preservation of public lands. But the other emphasis, the emphasis on development and extraction and privatization has never gone away either, and so many of the questions that we face today are how to mediate uh, the multiple demands that are placed on public lands, um, many of which have be, become instantiated in legislation, such as the Federal Land Policy Management Act, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the uh, laws governing scenic and wild rivers, uh, if you extend to offshore, the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the, the regulation of offshore drilling rights, a complex interaction between the public and the private over a variety of issues on a variety of fronts that relate to those, the use of those lands. 
and I haven't yet even mentioned energy policy, the question of fire suppression, forest management generally, um, debate over ANWR, um, continued interest in coal mining, coal gasification, strip mining. It's a long list of issues of concern to the, to the public and to the citizens who live around national lands and uh, have them much more inextricably uh, wrapped up in their daily livelihood, uh, particularly in the western part of the country, uh, and not so much here on the East Coast. So these, there's, there's a big congressional or statutory framework or edifice that's been constructed to deal with or address some of the basic policy issues uh, that face us today in dealing with public lands or indeed in dealing with issues about how private individuals use private lands, as uh, is the case in some controversies over the Endangered Species Act and um, other questions. But it also remains true that to enorm an enormous degree, the details, and some of these details are fairly large details, of what federal policy is going to be are questions that are determined by the executive branch uh, without the need for altering existing legislative frameworks. The margin of discretion that is allowed under even the most detailed of federal statutes is really quite substantial. And if you, if we could catalog the list of controversial issues over uh, natural resources and lands policy that have been in the papers, say, in the last year, I think you would find that most of them uh, are issues that are going to be resolved, or at least issues with respect to which the executive branch has the authority to resolve the question without returning to Congress for additional legislation. So questions like the scope or revision of the, of the National Environmental Policy Act regulations or the policy with regard to fire suppression or some important issues dealing with the implementation of the Endangered Species Act or whether snowmobiles are returning to Yellowstone and in what frequency. The roadless areas policy um, as to which the Supreme Court agreed to hear a case just this past week. All of these are questions uh, or at least substantial questions are being raised in all of these areas which are matters of policy making at the administrative or executive level. So the short of the story is it makes a tremendous difference who is the President of the United States and whose policy is being implemented. And we're going to be spending today discussing some of the aspects of uh, the uh, now nearly three-year-old Bush administration uh, policies with respect to uh, a few of the significant uh, issues um, facing our, our natural resources and lands policy. Uh, I'm going to end with my one political plug of the day. And it's not, a political, it's not a plug for a political party. It's a plug for the political process. Um, most elections. The political scientists tell us, the pollsters, exit pollsters tell us, are decided on issues of the economy. How is the economy going? Uh, what does your own personal pocketbook feel like at the time the election rolls around? And that will undoubtedly be true in 2004 as well. Nat uh, national security uh, also uh, looms large and may well influence a number of voters. Uh, but on these two issues, I would argue, uh, Ralph Nader in the 2000 campaign was more close to right than wrong, that there isn't much difference between the two parties. Any president of the United States is going to be terribly concerned about growing the economy. And any president of the United States is going to, is going to work hard in the best way he or she knows how to defend this country against terrorist attack. Where Nader was more wrong than right is with respect to a large array of domestic policies where there are significant policy differences between uh, the parties and where it does make a difference, uh, whether it is a, a President Bush or, say, a President Gore, uh, because there are significant differences in policy approach. Uh, those policies are 
policies that can be pursued to a substantial degree at the administrative level without uh, returning to Congress for additional legislative action and running into the inevitable slowdowns that occur when you run into that Byzantine organization. And so it does matter uh, who the president is. And, and my plea would be that more people ought to be voting on these issues <laughs> than should be voting on, on the economy or national security. And one reason I don't support Ralph Nader as much as I used to is that I think he obscured that important fact um, uh, in the last election. So there are, there are um, there's lots of activity in the, in the area of natural resources policy at the federal level. We're going to be learning about some of the salient dimensions of that um, set of issues today from some very distinguished speakers. And it is my pleasure now to turn the uh, stage over to the first of these two uh, for an opening discussion of the um, state of natural resources policy um, under the Bush administration by inviting to the, um, to the table our two distinguished uh, speakers for the first session. First, the Honorable Lynn Scarlett, who is Assistant Secretary uh, for Policy Management and Budget at the Department of the Interior. And prior to entering the administration in that post, uh, has served uh, as president of the Reason Foundation and who is a, a longstanding expert on uh, issues of environmental uh, policy, land use, and natural resources uh, issues. Uh, so Lynn, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And then the Honorable John Leshy, who served as solicitor uh, in the interior. That's the general counsel of the department. I love the title. I love solicitor of the interior. Uh, it, during uh, pretty much the entire two terms of the Clinton administration under Secretary Babbitt, and who has now uh, taken the position as Harry D. Sutherland, distinguished professor of law at uh, University of California Hastings College of Law. So it's a delight to have John here today as well. So the format um, is a set of opening remarks by Lynn and a, uh, of about 20 minutes in length, and, about, and then a, res, a set of remarks by John in response, um, and then some discussion between the two if they wish, but quickly opening it up to a group discussion uh, involving uh, questions and answers uh, from uh, the folks, the other folks assembled in the room. So let me ask uh, Assistant Secretary Scarlett to lead us off, and you feel free to sit there or to, st or to stand at the podium, whichever you prefer. I'll stand because my daughter says my mouth is connected to my arms and I need to move them or I can't speak. Uh, I am delighted to be here. I feel a little bit like old home week because John Leshy and I were just up at Harvard and indeed Lois Schiffer last week. So uh, we've gotten a chance to uh, chat a little bit and interact already. Uh, we're all, of course, aware of the high-spirited verbal volleys on environmental issues of the strident headlines of the rhetorical chasms that sometimes divide folks on these issues. But the sharp discourse often obscures, uh, it seems to me, the textures and complexities of environmental issues and the realities of a plural America, some of which uh, were just alluded to in the introduction. DOI, in many respects, lies at the confluence of those complexities and those pluralities. It lies at the confluence of people, land, and water, the confluence that brings tensions, but also opportunities and challenges. Now, before we consider those challenges, I want to give you a little bit of DOI's vital statistics to kind of put in context the sweep of decisions that we need to make on a daily basis at Interior that our predecessors and Mr. Leshy also faced. We manage one in every five acres of the United States, 20%. We manage about 800 dams and irrigation facilities. They provide drinking water to 31 million people, 
irrigation water to farmers who produce about 60% of the nation's vegetables, so think about that when you eat lunch. The lands and waters, the offshore waters, the 1.7 billion acres of Outer Continental Shelf, together with some of the uh, multiple-use lands, generate about one-third of the nation's domestic energy supply. We are, of course, host to some of this nation's most spectacular and special historic, cultural, and natural sites. We work with some 100, 520 tribes. Now, those stats, of course, link to real people. And what that means is how well we do our job really does affect the lives of each and every American, indeed each and every one of you. Determines to some degree whether there's food on the table, determines whether some folks in the West can turn on the tap, whether you will be able to warm your homes, or in Washington in particular we like to think of cooling them in summer, whether our children and ourselves can enjoy the grand vistas of Zion or Bryce, Shenandoah, or so many other places, whether eagles will soar, condors will soar too, or manatees can swim in the waters, and whether some 48,000 Indian children will have opportunities for a quality education. So you can see with that very brief set of vital statistics that our mission is multifaceted. Congress bequeathed to us great complexity. Our mission is both one of recreation and recreation access by statute. It is one of access to resources for resource use by statute. It is one of resource protection. We are probably the nation's premier conservation agency. And of course, also by statute, we have obligations to serve tribes with special trust responsibilities. The fulfill fulfillment of that mission beyond the headlines, the fulfillment of that mission is shaped by the statutory framework. You heard allusions to some of those statutes, but they are deeper and broader even than those mentioned. Some of them conflict with one another. We have court cases where one court opines in one way and another in another way at the same location. And we're sort of between a rock and a hard place. Shaped also by legal dynamics, much of what goes on in the endangered species realm right now is driven by court decisions on critical habitat designation, not by priority setting of critical species and their needs. Scientific complexity. There's a recent uh, NRC report on Klamath and the fish kill that made the headlines recently saying we don't really know what caused that. And yet in the midst of that we can't wait. We have to make some decisions about management. The ever-present reality, and John knows this well, of finite budgets, and the kaleidoscope of values, preferences, needs within human communities. All those things shape the context in which we operate and make our decisions really tough. What's our vision with this administration? Again, beyond the headlines, it is a vision of healthy lands and waters, a vision that combines that with an appreciation of the importance of thriving communities, which includes recreation, outdoor opportunities, and of dynamic economies. All three, I think we'd agree, are part of a sustainable world. Now, that's easy to envision. Healthy lands, thriving communities, dynamic economies, it is hard to achieve. And I want to just give you a sampling of challenges to get a flavor for just how difficult sometimes these decisions are. Forests. We heard allusions to the challenges uh, of managing our forests. And our recognition, and the recognition I think shared by many scientists, that our forests have fuel buildups now and sometimes densities that are 10 and 20 times their pre-European settlement densities. Invasive species, pinyon juniper, spread in areas where once it was just on outcroppings, tamarisk, and other invasives that are changing the dynamics of landscapes. Now with that fuel buildup is also accompanied a growing interface. We have population growth, 60% in Nevada, 40% in New Mexico, 30% in Colorado just over the last decade, and that means more tentacles of civilization out into 
lands once uninhabited. So for our forest management, when fire strikes, that now makes the challenges difficult. The fuel buildup turns what once would have been a natural event into catastrophic fires, fires sometimes that burn at the intensity or with the energy release of an atomic bomb. What's left in the wake of those catastrophic fires are lands that are incinerated with soils that, while not technically unable to grow things, in fact take many, many, many years beyond what would have been natural. So in that context, we have proposed our Healthy Forests Initiative. That initiative primarily focused on trying to pull out some of that built-up fuel. Now, this is not about commercial logging. You may have heard headlines to wit, but I ask you to actually look at the data. 2003, 83% of the projects we undertook were prescribed burns. By definition, they can't be commercial logging. The remainder, some were biological treatments through grazing of buffer zones around urban areas, and some was thinning out of trees. Stewardship contracting is a prong because we reckon that some 190 million acres are in poor condition. Now, we can't touch all of that. But we can, perhaps, by partnering with communities and having those communities go in, remove some of this material with a performance focus. And our guidelines state a performance focus with landscape health as the test of success. That those stewardship contractors may be able to capture some value and therefore ups offset some of the cost of doing these treatments. And so I went recently up to Applegate, uh, to an Applegate partnership in southern Oregon and to Hay Fork in northern California, where local communities are working to pull out some of this material and then work to transform it into products that can be utilized. Water, another realm of substantial challenge. In fact, I might argue the single biggest challenge of the 21st century in resource constraints. There's just not enough of it, or at least not enough of it in the way we currently manage it. We have a recent effort started by the previous administration and followed through by ours to bring California within its 4.4 million acre feet diet. A diet agreed upon, gosh, over 70 years ago, but which the state has exceeded for many, many years. Now, believe me, bringing them back within that diet was not easy. It took virtually round the clock negotiations, cooperation, dialogue, mediation with water districts, irrigators, seven states, and many others. But we succeeded. We have a quantification settlement agreement so that the state will begin on a glide path to staying within that diet. Bureau of Reclamation has initiated Water 2025, a vision, a vision of water trading and transfers, conservation, some new technologies, all designed to make every drop of water count and to get the water where it's needed for the multiple purposes to which, of course, water is put, including endangered species protection, farming, and other uses. Now, I'm going to pause very briefly on parks and our historic cultural and natural resources therein. I know Don Murphy, who's here with me from the Park Service, will spend more time on that. But one of our big challenges arriving on board was that we inherited, we inherited a backlog estimated at some $5 billion, $4.9 billion was what the GAO report said. Years of inattention. And so what this president committed to do was to begin to tackle that. Well, I come on board and I find out we don't even have a full inventory. We don't know what facilities we have, and we certainly don't know what condition they're in. So we put in place some management processes so that by the end of next year, we will have 100% inventory and all of the facilities with a condition assessment so we know how to prioritize and how to tackle this problem. And in the president's 2004 budget, an extra nearly quarter billion dollars applied to maintenance backlog, combining his road investment or proposed investment, we wait for Congress's action, and his facilities investment. Now let me stop at energy. Energy, probably one of those areas signally most subject to that strident discourse that I mentioned. 
It lies at the center of contention, but really it raises. The issues and debates raise important issues that deserve more than headlines. They deserve a careful look and the asking of some tough questions. Anwar. Anwar is a refuge created some years back of some 19 million acres. At the time of its creation, a certain portion, one and a half million or thereabouts, was designated as potential for uh, oil and gas exploration. This administration has proposed that what would amount to about 2,000 acres of that uh, actually have some exploration occur. Now, estimates at at least a million, barrel, a, billion, a million barrels per day, that's not insignificant. That's like 77 years of Missouri's entire energy needs, for example. Now, the challenges. Is it possible to actually capture some of that resource while lightening our environmental footprint so that we do not harm the caribou and other species that reside thereby. Our ability to build wells today relative to the 1980s is such that we can reduce our footprint by some 70% since that 1985 timeline. Through use of ice roads, we can bring equipment in and take it out without damaging the tundra. Sound reduction is another challenge one worthy of thinking about if one were moving forward. Now, the discussion on energy and minerals, I want to underscore, is not as it's often cast about, about environment versus industry. It really is about how and whether we warm our homes, power our transportation needs, have resources for taking photos, for turning on lights, for having light bulbs even when we think of minerals, for brushing our teeth. On the lower 48 states, to give you a sense of the context of this multiple use purpose and the degree to which we actually access resources, of the 700 million subsurface acres managed by the Bureau of Land Management, about 1.6% is in oil and gas exploration. Of the 260 million surface acres managed, about 0.06% is actually managed for minerals access. Now, I put those out with some trepidation because when you say small percents, I don't want to suggest that each and every one of those acres is insignificant. Those acres count too, and it deserves our attention to ask whether we ought to disturb them or whether we're striking the right balance. But let us ask those questions and think about how, when, where, and what are the consequences of inaction. I see I have five minutes, so I'm going to scurry to a little bit of big picture and beyond specific issues. Earth Day 1970 perhaps marked the milestone of modern environmentalism. It unfurled or resulted thereafter in the unfurling of our banner statutes. It was a wake-up call. I was in Santa Barbara in 1969 in the oil spill. I took part in the cleaning of some of the birds so damaged by that spill. But the tools unfurled in that set of banner statutes, while they helped us achieve some substantial improvements, the air is cleaner, the water is cleaner, and so on. It also yielded, in some instances, high conflict, because the tool to motivate human behavior tended to be the stick rather than the hand in partnership. High cost, sometimes because prescription prevailed and therefore did not enable innovation to flourish, and high unintended consequences because we had piecemeal decisions. Took one species separate from another, air separate from water, separate from waste. We'd fix one problem here, it would pop out somewhere else. One need only think of MTBE, for example, and air emissions. Now, we have an evolution, I think, underway as people realize that environmental progress is a journey, not a destination, and there's no reason to think we got all our institutional arrangements exactly right the first time round or in the intervening years since. So we have an institutional discovery process underway, and I'm going to just scurry through this in my three minutes remaining. I think we have a discovery process underway where people are seeking four features in the decision arrangements through which we achieve environmental goals. First, our context for more integrated decisions. And so I celebrate the work of the Duck Trap River Coalition, 26 partners across a mosaic of landscapes and a mosaic of challenges and issues, 
working to take that river, which is host to Atlantic salmon, and reduce erosion and sedimentation, replant native grasses, change old gravel pits into vernal pools, and so on. Doing so across a mosaic of land ownerships and in partnership and cooperation in an integrated way. Second feature, the need to tap local ideas and insights, what I call experiential knowledge or what Nobel laureate F.A. Hayek called the knowledge of time, place, and situation. The knowledge, for example, of the fishermen off the coast of Alaska who were fishing and finding through the information scientists provided them that their techniques were actually adversely affecting albatross. Now, the initial inclination of our Fish and Wildlife Service was to sh say, thou shalt not fish. But sitting down with the fishermen and tapping their insights and ideas, the fishermen said, you know, we have a way to do this differently, a way that will allow us to achieve reconciliation ecology, allow us to fish and protect the albatross too. A technique that we could not have invented in Washington, it took that local insight and local ideas. Third feature. Having used the stick, I think we lost the opportunity for inspiration. Working in cooperation and with a handshake at Buffalo Creek, our Fish and Wildlife Service through our Partners for Fish and Wildlife program is cooperating with dozens and dozens of farmers to do stream bank fencing, replant warm spring grasses, create some vernal pools, put up duck box, wood duck boxes, bat boxes, barn owl boxes, reducing the water or improving the water quality from 2,500 parts per million of bacterial count to 25 parts per million of phenomenal achievement. Doing so by applying a caring hand to the landscape in partnership. And that leads me to the final feature I think we continue to seek in our organizational and decision arrangements, and that is more elbow room for innovation, not just technological innovation, not the technological innovation, for example, of the El Dorado refinery who took nature's capital and built a wetland rather than a mechanical treatment plant to treat wastewater. But organizational innovation such as the Malpai borderland where they have created a grass bank, a new concept, a new institutional innovation. So with my time up, let me just draw a ribbon around this package, this four eyes of innovation, integration, inspiration, and local ideas and insight, and say that all of these arrangements that we briefly touched on, all of them are about cooperative conservation, cooperation across a mosaic of land ownerships and a plurality of interests. This is not new. We didn't invent it. It's emergent, spontaneous, and upwelling, but it's gaining momentum, and it holds infinite possibilities. We are seeking to nurture those possibilities at Interior with this administration. And I will conclude on that note by pointing to how we're doing that. We're putting our money where our mouth is. We have proposed in the President's budget over a half a billion dollars in cooperative conservation grants of various sorts, a substantial increase over our predecessors. We are looking at Endangered Species Act and building upon the innovations of the previous administration with Safe Harbor, a tool that better allows our neighbors and landowners across the country to work to protect species. With NEPA, we have put out new guidance documents on adaptive management to put the focus on performance and then adjustment accordingly to how well you are achieving performance, and also on consensus-based decisions. Turning NEPA on its head instead of being a back end, stand up when the green light goes on, sit down when the, when the red light goes on, a back-end participatory process, make it a front-end process, where we all engage and sit down and try to hammer out a consensus management alternative, which we will then import into our scoping document, potentially as a preferred alternative. Stewardship contracting, I mentioned we're working on joint fact-finding, recognizing that data battles, as I have my mountain of data and you have yours, often stands in the way of results and decisions and consensus. So instead, inaugurating joint fact-finding, we're up front. We sit with communities and say, what information is important? What do you need to know? What methodologies can we agree on? Now, I know I'm going over time. My apologies. Just a couple more words. At MIT, I recently spoke, and someone said, well, is this cooperative conservation stuff? 
mere snowflakes on the horizon, or is it the tip of an iceberg? I think it's more the tip of an iceberg. We just haven't looked at it. We've been looking maybe at the tip and not seeing what lies beneath. Consider wetlands. Each year through our regulatory actions, Section 404 wetlands mitigation, on net we protect about 20,000 acres per year over the last decade. Through cooperative conservation, our non-regulatory partnering tools, by contrast, we restore, recreate, rehabilitate, or protect some 300,000 acres a year over the last decade. Now, cooperative conservation does require better metrics. It requires monitoring. It requires the art of mediation to supplant habits of debate. It requires new methods of governance, new methods such as some of the tools I mentioned. It does set forth, though, through cooperative conservation, a vision of citizen stewards, a vision, I think, held by Aldo Leopold in his writings when he imagined a nation of self-motivated stewards. It's a vision that brings together that healthy lands, thriving communities, and dynamic economies that I think all of us yearn for. Thank you. As Lynn mentioned, uh, we, we tried out our show last week in uh, Cambridge, so we're uh, now taking it on the road. And uh, uh, it's early uh, in the morning, but um, um, she spoke of rhetorical chasms and sharp dialogue, and I'll do my best uh, to provide some of that. This is a debate, after all. Uh, I agree with Lynn. The issues in natural resource policy are complex and challenging. Uh, I think that's the last time I will agree with her. Uh, this morning. Uh, and apologies to Ralph Nader, uh, uh, what Norm said, uh, it does make a difference um, <clears throat> uh, at the polls. And pr probably no place has it made a sharper difference, frankly, uh, the outcome of the last election than on uh, natural resource uh, policies. Uh, I think everybody uh, who pays some attention to these issues probably expected some change uh, uh, that with the uh, uh, investiture in office of the president uh, with the Republicans in control of Congress and increasingly of the courts. And then after 9-11, with the uh, uh, public attention certainly diverted to security concerns, uh, everybody expected there would be some change. But uh, I, I think it's fair to say traditional conservation interests have been taken aback by the breadth and depth of the uh, change and the administration's uh, pro-development natural resource uh, policies. And, and also, and maybe even more surprised and shocked, at the lack of public backlash, and I want to talk about both of those things. Uh, the administration's policies, uh, the Republican Party's had a long history of, of stewardship, as um, Lynn talked about, and, and sound conservation policy dating back to, to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who's really uh, the hero to many of us who work in this area. Um, uh, that idea of stewardship, of looking beyond the sort of short-term political and economic forces to, to a, a broader, longer vision for how we manage our resources, uh, really started in this country with Teddy Roosevelt. But stewardship, frankly, is not a word that readily comes to mind uh, when we talk about the Bush administration uh, initiatives. Um, more surprising is the fact that the Bush administration policies are, are not really sort of conservative uh, ideological principles. This is not about the free market. This is not about sort of devolving governmental responsibilities down to the lowest level. There's some lip service paid to those principles, but when they conflict with the administration's preferred outcome, those principles are thrown over the side, and I'll give a couple of examples of that. How does the administration settle on its preferred outcome in, in most of these natural resource, uh, challenging natural resource decisions? If you look through the decisions and the policy initiatives that this administration has followed, uh, it becomes apparent, I think, that they ask basically one question uh, when they come to make a decision. That one answer to that one question has more explanatory power than any other factor in their decision making. And that question is simply, what does the industry want? Uh, and by industry here, I mean basically the sort of traditional industrial concerns and logging, mining, energy, that sort of thing. That gut level preference for what industry wants um, is the administration's natural resource policy uh, agenda. 
In one sense, that's no surprise. I mean, that's where the, the background of the president and the vice president, that's their source of campaign funds, and that's their appointments throughout the natural resource uh, agencies. And it carries with it some advantages if you sort of reflexively prefer uh, the in, uh, industry-supported outcome. It's a, it ensures a hard core of readily mobilized support for your decisions and, and ample campaign funds. That preference has been played out in situation after situation. It's a long, long list in terms of uh, hard rock mining on the federal lands, uh, <clears throat> rolling back environmental regulations, taking the position that the government has no authority to say no to mining on its own lands, uh, <clears throat> uh, to saying that uh, metal mining companies have not just the opportunity but the legal right to dump uh, waste on un, uh, as much land as they want uh, um, uh, without the administration or the government having the right to say uh, no. Uh, in energy, uh, making available every acre that is available under existing laws for oil and gas leasing, uh, coal leasing, and the like. Logging, uh, favoring intensive recreation, snowmobiles, motorized transportation, et cetera, over uh, milder forms of recreation. In process, uh, NEPA, uh, taking the sort of flagship of the American uh, environmental laws and uh, <laughs> carving out some very large exceptions to it. Uh, changing the planning processes for the federal land management agencies to sort of move away from biological concerns uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and downplaying the role of environmental protection. Uh, it's been particularly hostile, this administration, to protecting the character of wild federal lands. And that's worth pausing over for a moment because for several decades, a cornerstone of of uh, national uh, natural resource policy has been the simple idea that, that uh, substantial tracts of federal land ought to be basically preserved in their natural condition. You know, the Americans invented the idea of the national park, for example, which has been called the best idea we ever had, and we've exported that idea around the world. Uh, we've also invented the idea of wilderness protection, that is, basically leaving lands roadless in their natural condition, uh, maintaining large tracts in that, in that way, and that was adopted in 1964, coming up on the 40th anniversary. That idea has also taken root around the globe. Um, the mining, energy, grazing, ORV, and similar industries have always resisted wilderness designations. They don't like them for obvious reasons. Uh, this administration, again, uh, by asking the question, fundamental question, what does the industry want, has been uh, palpably hostile, I think, to the idea of wilderness. Um, <clears throat> in the Clinton administration, uh, the president signed a rule that kept 60 million acres of national forest lands in, in roadless condition. Um, the timber industry took that to court. Uh, early in the Bush administration, a federal district judge in Idaho uh, threw out the rule, the administration uh, on procedural grounds, and the administration uh, decided not to appeal it. Uh, the environmental groups intervened in the lawsuit, took it up to the Court of Appeals, and got it reversed, reinstating the rule. Uh, <clears throat> the administration then moved administratively to weaken that rule with exceptions. And then a few months ago, in a separate circuit in Wyoming, another federal district judge threw out the rule uh, and issued an injunction nationwide against the rule. Once again, the Bush administration decided not to appeal. Uh, environmentalists are trying to appeal that also to the Court of Appeals, and the Bush administration is basically taking the position that they have no right now to intervene and appeal. Uh, so uh, this has taken uh, the hostility to roadlessness, I think, to a new level. A similar, if less prominent, story is played out on another category of federal lands where roadless issues are important, and that's the actually the largest federal land manager is the Bureau of Land Management. It manages about 270 million acres of federal lands. Uh, under the last four presidents, uh, the BLM had uh, taken uh, to steps to identify and protect until Congress can make a final decision. Uh, uh, to protect the areas under its supervision that it determined were eligible for congressional protection, uh, so holding them until Congress can make a decision. In April of this year, the, this administration uh, reversed course, decided this policy was illegal, and it abandoned it. Uh, the result is that many millions of acres of, of public lands, much of it in the so-called so essential west in the Colorado Plateau, are now vulnerable to uh, mining, logging, road building, and other activities that could forever destroy its wilderness character without Congress uh, having a chance uh, to address the issue. It's done all this and much else in clean air and clean water. Um, it's, a, it's a very long list. And interesting, as I said, it's done it without a lot of backlash. Let me talk about that for a little bit. Why is this? Uh, why has uh, the backlash not come? 
In part, it's because the administration, and I give them a lot of credit here, has been very skillful uh, in how it's handled these initiatives to avoid a backlash. I think it's very difficult to argue that the American people really want this kind of outcome, that the American people really support the idea that the most essential question is, what does the industry want? Um, we had a Secretary of Defense back in the Eisenhower administration who came from General Motors, and he once famously said, what's good for General Motors is good for America. Uh, I don't think people really believe that, ultimately. Uh, and I don't think that smart Republican strategists believe that either. And uh, in a now famous confidential memorandum, that was leaked. Um, uh, Republican strategist, prominent Republican strategist Frank Luntz wrote, the most popular federal programs today are those that preserve and protect our natural heritage through conservation in public lands and waters and parks and open spaces. Further, the environment is probably the single issue on which Republicans in general and President Bush in particular is most vulnerable. Um, but the administration seems to be getting away with it. Why? Well, for one thing, uh, they went to school on the experience of President Reagan and, and his flamboyant Secretary of the Interior, James Watt. Some of you uh, may remember or have heard about James Watt. Uh, he was a very confrontational guy, delighted in it, and he was excoriated and ultimately deposed because of, of this style. Uh, the stylistic contrast of this administration to James Watt could not be a sharper. It's, it's staged, managed its policies very skillfully to avoid that kind of Watt-like uh, backlash. In the 2000 campaign, President Bush didn't say much about the environment, but he did say three things. One was he supported regulation of carbon dioxide emissions to address climate change. He supported full funding for protecting the park system, and he supported ample dollars for public purchase of uh, recreation and conservation lands. And he, uh, once in office, very quickly retreated on all three of those um, <clears throat> and began, as I said, systematically cutting back on environmental regulation and land conservation. Those cutbacks uh, have been characterized by the administration in a script that follows the rest of Frank Luntz's memo, because most of Frank Luntz's memo is all about how do you talk about the environment to soothe people. Um, and you soothe them with happy talk. And there was a long list in this memo, quite interesting, of, of things to say. You know, sure, your audience, you're committed to preserving and protecting the environment. The three words America's, our Americans are looking for in environmental policy are safer, cleaner, and healthier. Do not raise economic arguments first. Stay away from risk assessment, cost-benefit analysis, and other terminology used by uh, industry and corporations. Put your uh, plans in terms of the future, not the past or the present. We are trying to make things even better for the future. That's Frank Luntz. Um, we have Gail Norton, Secretary of the Interior, a uh, very friendly, affable person who uh, endlessly repeats the mantra of consultation, cooperation, and communication, all in the name of conservation, the so-called four Cs, a key part of this communication package. Underneath, the administration makes one anti-conservation decision after another, uh, often with little communication, cooperation, or consultation except with the industry. Uh, usually disclosed, and this is particularly interesting, in the slowest news cycle available. If you looked at the list of the decisions the administration has made and then ask, and then ask when were they made, when were they announced to the public, uh, it's almost all on Friday afternoon, usually before a uh, holiday weekend. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's stock political advice uh, to release news that uh, you think the public might be uncomfortable with on Friday afternoon, especially before a holiday weekend, where few people see it and, and uh, those who do see it can't readily organize uh, against it. Uh, James Carville recently quipped, if you judge the Bush administration environmental record on how many of its announcements are made on Friday afternoon, you know they know they're doing wrong. Uh, <clears throat> The, the devotion to this pattern would be actually comical if it weren't, weren't so effective. Uh, the administration announced uh, uh, it was going to open 9 million acres of federal lands on Alaska's North Slope. This is not the Arctic Refuge. This is to the west of the Arctic Refuge. To oil and gas leasing, done on a Friday afternoon. It adopted a very broad interpretation of federal court decisions to initiate a regulatory change that rolls back protections for 20 million acres of wetlands, done on a Friday afternoon. Uh, the new source performance review decision, which rolls back the uh, cleanup requirements for aging power plants, done on a Friday afternoon. Fast-tracking federal land logging projects by carving out large exemptions to the National Environmental Policy Act, done on a Friday afternoon. 
the ruling I mentioned that gives mining companies the legal right, not just the opportunity to use as much federal land as they want for waste dumps done on a Friday afternoon. Small wonder that conservationists have come to dread Friday afternoon. It's Friday, isn't it? So uh, watch. Um, <clears throat> It's also been very good uh, at um, playing politics um, with, uh, with crises, with real uh, serious public policy problems. Two here in particular, fire, as Lynn talked about, and energy. Um, uh, I think it's frankly manipulated uh, public concern over these two real issues uh, and used them as a wedge to um, uh, tilt federal natural resource decision-making processes sharply toward industry and to open up many federal lands to commercial logging and energy development. Uh, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of talk in the press is and the public is generally aware of the debate about the Arctic refuge and whether to open up the coastal plain to oil and gas leasing. What's not been really in the public debate is the fact that the administration has in the lower 48 uh, made oil and gas the preferred use of hundreds of millions of acres of federal lands, including many wild areas. Um, this is uh, perhaps not surprising, uh, given the fact that the energy industry apparently wrote the energy policy early in the administration uh, in the deliberations of the Vice President's Energy Task Force, uh, the records of which the administration is still 30 months later trying to keep secret. Uh, but that's just the beginning. Uh, the concern over fire policy and energy policy has led, uh, has provided cover really for the administration to jettison the long-standing idea of multiple use, of considering all kinds of different uses of federal lands. They've basically instructed federal land managers to come down on the side of the energy in industry and the logging industry unless they have a very good reason not to do so. I've mentioned the carving out of exemptions from the National Environmental Policy Act. They've also moved to change the planning regulations to, to uh, downplay biological diversity concerns in federal uh, Forest Service and BLM planning processes. Um, interestingly, on both fire and energy, I think the administration is open to the criticism that its, its policies really don't reflect or point in the right way for solutions to these genu genuine problems. The most pressing fire problem is what to do about building in uh, remote areas. Uh, and the solution to that has very much to do with things like building codes and vegetation requirement, clearing requirements around structures and all of that. It has nothing to do or very little to do with commercial logging uh, in remote areas. Yet the Bush policy is really silent on, on the building code issue and, and heavy on the uh, logging issue. Likewise on energy, I mean we have an energy problem, but a tiny, tiny increase in fuel efficiency would produce more energy savings than drilling the Arctic Refuge or, or uh, opening up all acres of federal land. Could not make an ultimate difference in our energy picture because we have such a small percentage of the world's reserves and we uh, consume such a high, um, a high percentage. Um, I mentioned that the, one of the interesting aspects is the administration has not really followed sort of free market conservative principles. Uh, the best example I can think of here is really kind of a telling one. Uh, there's been a kind of a boomlet in recent years to solve the longstanding problem of grazing and overgrazing on federal lands by buying up ranches in voluntary market-based transactions and then having the government retire the permits to graze. Uh, that go with those ranches on federal land, so that you simply retire the public lands from grazing by voluntary buyouts at market prices. Uh, <clears throat> um, and there's been a lot of interest. It's a classic case for sort of free market environmentalism. You know, solve the problem not by regulation, but by market transactions. Uh, a conservation group early in this administration asked Secretary Norton to do just this. They bought some ranches in Utah in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument that owned grazing permits on a million acres of federal land. And they went to the secretary and said, we'll give you back these permits if you retire the lands from grazing. Uh, <clears throat> um, when that decision came before her, she balked, basically. Her, uh, Solicitor, my successor uh, as the general counsel of the department, issued some legal opinions throwing up roadblocks to this process, saying, no, you can't do it. Why? Because basically the opponents of that national monument uh, and the local supporters of grazing in general uh, uh, protested. And so the administration decided to placate uh, the sort of right-wing opponents to the national monument rather than endorse this kind of marketplace transaction. 
uh, leading actually one of the free market environmental groups to give the administration a D in its report card uh, because of this issue. Uh, <clears throat> it's also been very quick to ignore um, the kind of ideological conservative principle of devolving decision making to local governments. Uh, the Bush Justice Department uh, recently told a federal court in Nevada uh, that federal mining law preempted uh, an effort by a local county to regulate a, uh, a, a mineral processing plan, uh, even on private land. Um, <clears throat> the overriding federal interest in this kind of preemption was a little mysterious. The mineral being mined on federal land was for kitty litter. Uh, so it's a little hard to see uh, what the strong national interest was. Uh, it's also, uh, uh, the administration has also aggressively pushed the Congress to give it authority to preempt state law uh, to secure rights of way for energy facilities uh, and the like. Um, as, uh, as Norm mentioned, the administration has aggressively used executive authority uh, to implement uh, its policies. It sought remarkably little from, from Congress. Now, the Clinton administration did the same thing, frankly, but the Clinton administration was facing a Congress of a, a somewhat different stripe. Uh, with the Republican Congress, it's a little cu curious as to why this administration uh, has not sought to enlist the help of Congress on many issues. Almost all of what it has done that I've listed, uh, except for the Arctic Refuge, it's done without Congress uh, by unilateral executive action. I think the explanation is really pretty obvious. The administration really doesn't want these kinds of policy initiatives to be subjected to the kind of public debate that usually accompanies the congressional uh, processes. Its reluctance to go to Congress, in other words, is really of a piece with its penchant for announcing natural resource initiatives uh, on late Friday afternoon. Uh, another illustration of this is the administration has sought to make its changes as permanent as possible even without Congress, and it's hit on some pretty clever ways uh, to do that, and frankly some pretty pernicious ways. Um, uh, when the administration decided, for example, as I mentioned, that the Bureau of Land Management had no authority to administratively protect roadless lands under its jurisdiction to study them for possible preservation as wilderness, it didn't ask Congress to confirm this. Uh, and it didn't put this policy in place by a rulemaking that, that proposes something and has public comment on it. Uh, it did not pursue the four Cs. Uh, it uh, instead chose to wrap its decision uh, in a secretly negotiated, uh, legally binding settlement of a Mormon lawsuit brought by the state of Utah. And the same day, went to a friendly local federal judge and, uh, who happened to be Senator Hatch's former chief of staff and got approval for it. Um, another example is found in the Endangered Species Act that, that Lynn mentioned. The ESA has been a thorn in the side of, of land and water developments, uh, developers, but the administration has been reluctant to ask Congress to reform it uh, for various reasons we could talk about. So it searched for less uh, public uh, and direct ways to undermine the act. Uh, in a recent uh, court case in, uh, in New Mexico, um, uh, the administration argued that the ESA cannot be enforced against those who contract for, who sign contracts to get water out of federal water projects because the administration says those contracts insulate water users uh, from giving up water to, to meet the needs of endangered species. Now, the interesting thing about this issue is that federal courts have ruled on this uh, many times and always ruled in favor of the government, holding that these contracts, uh, the, uh, interpreting these contracts to allow the government to interrupt water deliveries for public needs, like the Endangered Species Act. So the courts have ruled on this issue several times, uh, but the administration is now taking a new and radical position uh, that the contracts know should be reinterpreted, basically, to not provide that kind of opportunity to serve uh, the ESA. Uh, a very quiet, uh, under-the-radar kind of decision, but typical of uh, what's been happening. So the administration is taking a very broad view of pro property and contract rights, and, and that gives it, from its perspective, the, the mechanism to bind future administrations and future Congresses uh, to these uh, outcomes. So it's really a kind of a subtle sort of privatization, you could say, of, of federal resources. It's sort of a disguised throwback to the Gilded Age of the 19th century. Uh, and it's very shrewd and uh, effective contrast to the sort of flamboyant uh, privatization exercises uh, of the Bush administration. Well, um, 
Let me conclude by pointing out a couple of, of things about administration policies writ large, which I think also have a huge and deleterious effect on natural resource management. Uh, and in the long run, may have the most negative effects of all. Uh, the first is the administration's abandonment of a leadership role uh, on these issues, the, this, the stewardship idea, the idea that America really helped invent 100 years ago and has successfully exported around the world. The other countries of the world have long looked to us for leadership on this issue, uh, and they're not getting it from this administration. The second is uh, that the administration's fiscal policies, I think, are frankly designed ultimately to starve the national government for funds. A lot of these stewardship efforts uh, that Lynn talked about uh, and that um, uh, observers know uh, have to exist take money. They don't take a, actually a very much money in the big scheme of things uh, compared to other governmental programs, but they do take money. Uh, and nearly all of that money for these programs is considered so-called discretionary money. That is, it's not entitlement money. It's not like Social Security and Medicare. Uh, it is in that relatively small portion of the federal budget uh, that is considered uh, discretionary. Discretionary funds, as everybody in Washington knows, are, are the first ones cut uh, when you uh, make efforts. As sooner or later, efforts are going to have to be made to bring federal expenditures in line with federal revenues. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that natural resource stewardship programs are among the most at risk uh, as the federal deficits soar. Well, as I said at the outset, uh, being a captive of industry has some built-in advantages, um, <clears throat> but I think that asking only what is good for industry is a terribly short-sighted natural resources policy. Uh, we should also be asking what our children and our grandchildren uh, think about us and what we are doing with our resources. And there's almost no evidence that this is happening in this administration, and that's a real shame. Thank you. Well, I think you were true to your opening remark, John. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> um, I feel I have to, but I kind of shudder at asking if you want to say a few words in response, because we, it may take you a long time to respond. But let me as, see if uh, the Assistant Secretary has a few things to say, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, in the interest of time, let me try to be quick. I certainly could give an entire other speech of, of rebuttal, but I won't. Uh, but let me start with the compass. Uh, John makes the statement that the sole compass we have is in service of industry. I think that uh, substantially undermines the complexities of the issues we face and the decisions we take. Let me mention a few. On mining, we did indeed make some changes to the proposed regs that the previous administration had. Uh, we did so because we thought they uh, were both inconsistent with the law and overreached. However, we retained certain elements of them, one of which was bonding and one of which was certain performance standards, not at all desired by the industry, uh, and yet we thought those are the right things to hold uh, the industry accountable. Snowmobiles. Uh, snowmobiles in Yellowstone um, is, is one of the complex challenges that we face in terms of balancing uh, recreation opportunities and at the same time protecting the environment. The previous administration proposed uh, simply banning them. Our approach has been to say how can we strike a balance here? Uh, and with that we have proposals to cap the numbers that can come in on a daily basis to require that they have guides and or uh, training before they can uh, enter the park on snowmobiles, they must use specific kinds of equipment that have 90 percent reductions in emissions. Uh, this is not what the industry wanted, but we thought this was the right balance. Water, the 4.4 million decision uh, to keep California within its diet that I described, this was resisted for years, for indeed seven decades, by farmers and other uh, industries. Uh, I interests in California, but we struck true to our word. The previous administration, by the way, made grand gestures, but we rolled up our sleeves and did the tough work. Healthy forest community, healthy forest initiative. If you were out with me at Hay Fork or Lakeview or uh, at the Applegate Partnership and see these folks who are living in rural areas jeopardized by some of the forests in these poor condition, you would understand this is not about business. This is about the safety of people it's farmers, it's small town folks, it's everyone, frankly, in those communities. Uh, let me briefly mention, so that's the compass. Um, let us understand complexity, and it's a complexity we, we, we strive to 
uh, think about as we address these issues. Uh, second, I want to say what, what you see depends on where you look. Of course, at any administration at any point in time, you can see things you don't like. You can see a lot of things you don't like. But to some degree, it depends on where you're looking. <clears throat> if you're coming from a tradition of thinking that the test of success is in the regulatory uh, 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 actions undertaken, uh, then you're missing a big part of the picture, that, that iceberg that I described in cooperative conservation. We've put forth hundreds of millions of cooperative conservation grants uh, and are engaging in training our land managers to work in partnership at local areas. The park maintenance, uh, which uh, Mr. Leshy scurried over, he scurried over because the previous administration essentially left it unattended. And so we came in and both with money and management effort have begun to address that challenge and get these parks in a condition that we can all celebrate. It deserves our best effort. Again, uh, what you see depends upon where you look. Mr. Leshy mentioned executive action. By golly, I'll bet you if I put their stack versus our stack, theirs is probably bigger. Maybe I'll try that and see. Uh, executive action was a common practice. A healthy forest initiative, energy, uh, this, uh, uh, gateway communities legislation. These are things we've all striven to achieve through legislation. Mining. Our secretary sent a letter to the, to the Congress and said, we'd like to work with you on mining legislation. Here are the principles that we think are appropriate. Uh, and then let me make a, conclude just with a uh, comment on certain specific uh, issues that Mr. Leshy raised. Uh, wilderness. This administration continues to protect all of the wilderness and all of the wilderness study areas that were identified in the FLIPMA Section 603 process that Congress created. And that process was a 15-year process. They said, identify wilderness and wilderness study areas, present those to the Man Office of Management and Budget and in turn to the President, who will in turn present a package to Congress. Congress said, we want to reserve to ourselves the right to permanent wilderness designation. And so that process ended, that 603 process, uh, in about 1991, and then there was a two-year kind of uh, 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 proving ground, if you will, and so in 1993 was the end point. All of the wilderness and wilderness study areas identified through that process, we continue to manage uh, in exactly the same way the previous administration has done. What we did differently was that with the recognition that the 603 process ended, we said, look, uh, going forward, we know that there are still wilderness areas out there to identify. Section 201 of FLIPMA allows us to inventory for those characteristics, and we will continue to do so, and we are doing so. Section 202 of FLIPMA is a land use planning process whereby one makes management decisions. And through that, uh, through that process, we said, if you inventory for wilderness, then through the land use planning process, those characteristics and values will be part of that land use planning discussion in open public fora, and we may manage for wilderness accordingly. But we will manage under the land use planning process, not under the Section 603 provisions of FLIPMA because we thought that that was counter to the law. Uh, so when you get to the details of these matters, uh, you often find uh, a lot of uh, uh, complexities that really matter and really matter in terms of understanding the performance, the results, and the outcome and the vision. Uh, so with that, you know, again, I could go on with, with, with so much more, but uh, let us give some time for some discussion with uh, those of you out there. Great. Thanks very much. Questions? Comments? Yes. Um, this question is for Assistant Secretary Scarlett. Um, could you explain why the Department of Interior routinely requests less money then it knows it requires to fully implement the critical habitat and listing programs under the Endangered Species Act, while at the same time requesting and receiving increasing amounts of money over time for every other budget item of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, this, is a, this is a persistent challenge for us, and we continue to increase the funding that we propose for critical habitat. Last year, 
uh, finding additional court cases. To put this into context, uh, designation of cri critical habitat right now is being primarily driven by a whole host of court cases, many of which the previous administration uh, 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 was subject to and experienced and also had the same challenge of trying to get adequate funds for listing. And in fact, we inherited a bubble of um, un, uh, undesignated critical habitat, which we then had to step up and try to meet the challenge of, of uh, fulfilling. Uh, this last year, when we had a new bubble of critical habitat designations, we actually did a reprogramming and to put more money into that so that we could meet the court requirements. Uh, we proposed in 2004 increases, and I'm not in the position to discuss 2005 because it's not yet public. But again, it is a, uh, a very challenging issue, one in which we are trying to fulfill the requirements of the court. However, lest anyone think that that is the answer to our environmental and endangered species problems, I think we need to look elsewhere. Uh, there are several recent studies. There is some scientific, for full disclosure, dispute about this, but uh, several recent studies that suggest that designation of critical habitat does not result in species recovery. Species recovery occurs through managing habitat in ways that benefit species. And that's where we're trying to put our money in recovery actions. The over half a billion dollars we proposed in cooperative conservation, much of that is directed towards endangered species uh, habitat, threatened species habitat protection, so we can get beyond this issue of uh, continued endangerment, continued listing, and therefore the challenges posed by critical habitat designation, which I think is where you'd want to be too in terms of recovery. Uh, on that. Yeah, I think is that we practice as humans what we live in as a creation that we look at 2,000 acres as you mentioned and uh, a wilderness area and we tend to think 2,000 acres, gee that's a pretty good sized town. We don't remember that that's half an acre here and a half an acre there and 10 acres there and five acres there. And gee, when you connect them all, that's a lot of biodiversity to stir. That's the first policy that we brought forth. Uh, there's several others, but I would like to remind you that Mr. Lee told me so glad they quoted, also said that our children, if I may miss what we should know, will also. And, and we agree. And that is why we continue to protect many, many, many millions of acres of wilderness and continue to inventory to see whether there's more to protect. Uh, let me take you in just a second, but first let me explain something about this room. When we go to question and answers, those little black dots on your desk become active for everybody. So if you pass a piece of paper over it or move your hand so that it touches it, you'll hear what we just heard in, in the uh, sound system. So if you can set up a little protective area around those black, <laughs> black bubbles, we'll, we'll be in better shape. And did you want to say something about yeah, just, the last question? Just a couple of quick comments. Uh, first, the gentleman back here, I, I'm not sure everybody understood. The 2,000 acres he was talking about were the 2,000 acres that Ms. Carlett said would be disturbed if oil and gas leasing took place in the Arctic Refuge. Uh, and he's right. I mean, if you think of the 2,000 acres as sort of a buckshot pattern, uh, of disturbance over a, a quite large area. Uh, the impacts are pretty terrific. On the Endangered Species Act, just a couple of words, and I know you'll hear more about this from J.B. Rule, who's one of the leading uh, experts on the act. Um, uh, what's happening is, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, the, the Endangered Species Act is being sort of nibbled away at uh, piecemeal by positions the administration is taking in court. Uh, the, the laws that Congress is passing last week, this week, and next week are going to contain a number of exemptions, new exemptions for the Endangered Species Act supported by the administration involving the Department of Defense, for example. You know, we built the greatest fighting force in the world with a military that's subject, been subject to the Endangered Species Act, and now they want and they're going to get a significant exemption from it. Uh, the silvery minnow problem in New Mexico, uh, Senator Domenici has worked with the administration to fix that problem with an administrative, ex a, a, a statutory exemption from the Endangered Species Act, and that's what we'll see more of. Rather than taking the complexities and the real challenges of the ESA on in a broad way, we're seeing these little um, uh, nibbling away that, that are going to add up to significant uh, exemptions. Give me I just wanted to, uh, I guess I was surprised that Mrs. Scarlett uh, 
brought up the snowmobile issue in Yellowstone and, and the wilderness issue as examples of how the uh, current administration's compass is oriented differently than the way Mr. Lesh presented it. And I guess uh, I'd be interested in hearing from both panelists' comment on um, their perspectives of how the International Snowmobile Manufacturers Association um, participated in that process, what, what side of the Bush administration decision they came down on, and also on the, the recent um, case that the Supreme Court just agreed to hear last week regarding the enforcement of um, protective measures in wilderness study areas in Utah. So if you could both address um, the, the Bush, current Bush administration stance on those issues, I'd be interested to, to hear that. On the snowmobile issue, uh, uh, you're simply um, incorrect in your observation that the position we took was the one put forth by the um, industry. Um, and something you said, I think, is an important thing for all to reflect on, and that was you used the term which side, as if these issues are about one side and another side. The nature of complexity is that there are not two sides. There are many complexities, and what we often have are challenges of optimization across many values. In the case of snowmobiles, uh, the industry actually wanted a persistence of go anywhere, do anything, at any time uh, with any machine. And uh, that was their starting position. Um, as we looked at the challenges of snowmobiles and, of course, recognized that they had been long used in that park and, in fact, in many others, dating back many, many years, uh, we asked ourselves, was it possible to both continue some use, because that is a uh, segment of the plural American population that has uh, 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 enjoyment of the parks, and, and uh, is there a way to both accommodate that segment of the American population, but reduce the air quality impacts, the noise impacts, and the footprint, that is, where those go. And that's why we ended up with a decision, and perhaps Don will talk more about this in his presentation um, as a representative of the Park Service. That's why we ended up with a thing that required, uh, a, a conclusion that required, required guided tours uh, and training. It required uh, new machines that had 90 percent reduction in emissions. It requires uh, a whole array of other uh, um, provisions, and it's a performance focus and an adaptive management plan. And by that I mean if the plan we set forth, in fact, does not achieve the performance goals set forth, uh, it has provisions for us to go back to the drawing board, re-examine, and, and, and adjust. I see you nodding your head, no, but uh, that is indeed what is so. Um, I guess I'll turn to uh, Mr. Leshy may want to talk about that. Just, I guess, two words on snowmobiles. Um, the uh, manufacturers are a lot happier with the Bush administration position than with the Clinton administration position. Um, uh, the wilderness case you mentioned is actually a very interesting one. Um, the uh, some environmental groups in Utah uh, brought a lawsuit uh, that. Uh, alleged that the government was not, the land managers, the BLM in this case, was not doing enough to regulate off-road vehicle use in wilderness study areas in, in the state, and they won. Uh, the Bush administration solicitor general, uh, who was the leading the third ranking person in the Justice Department and sets the government's litigating position, asked the Supreme Court to review this case because he said in very sweeping terms that this was an unwarranted almost unconstitutional interference by the federal courts in the workings of the land management agencies. And the court agreed to take the case last week, uh, which I think is a very, very troublesome sign. And I expect that there's a very good possibility this Supreme Court, uh, conservative dominated now, is going to decide that case in such a way that will effectively uh, close off the federal courts ability to review a lot of these decisions. So I think it is a very troublesome development, and it's strongly supported by this administration. I'm going to take uh, one more, and then we'll uh, take a, what, a 10-minute break? Okay. Uh, right here on the aisle. This address to the representative from the industry, which is a I like to use to drive uh, If, in fact, we're trying to engage the public in better processes, can you explain to me? why the energy bill severely restricts jurisdiction. In fact, it's taken out of my circuit, thrown into the D.C. Um, and secondly, why the statute of limitations of the defense is greater than it is. Why the 
by the, excuse me? The statute of limitations under NEPA, I believe that they have to file lawsuits within 30 days. That's part of the forest uh, uh, plan of the. Uh, uh, that's department. not a general provision. Um, I haven't been sufficiently myself directly involved with the energy bill to uh, discuss that. What I can talk to you about is uh, more broadly what we're trying to do to enhance public participation. But but let me also comment that um, I think you know your opening characterization of whatever it was ad administry or something like that is is unfortunate. Um, it's that kind of rhetoric that I think stands in the way of the sort of civil discourse that we need on these important issues. Uh, you know, there's a lot more I could say about some of the challenges that the previous industry, uh, the previous, excuse me, administration left us. <laughs> uh, that the previous administration left us. Um, but, I, but I choose not to do that because I don't think that, um, that Careful discussion and thought comes from simply throwing, um, throwing darts at the wall. Uh, but, but I do want to comment, and I wish you would think about that as you go forward. Um, but, you know, I'm someone who's never, never worked for industry, never been in industry, lived my life in a, in a nonprofit, uh, been a bird watcher since I was five years old, a canoeer, a hiker. Um, these values are very important to me. And uh, by the same token, I also yearn for a world of uh, cooperation rather than conflict, of conversation rather than uh, hyperbole and debate, and trying to find the environmental institutions and the environmental decision-making arrangements that will help us get there, I think is a big challenge for the 21st century. What are we doing to try and foster that? Uh, I mentioned very briefly NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, we put out two environmental statement memoranda. Uh, one is on adaptive management, which uh, <coughs> the environmental statement memoranda are essentially guidance to our bureaus on how to uh, function and operate and implement, in this case, NEPA. And with the adaptive management uh, guidance, we, um, we ask the bureaus to, as they move through the scoping documents and land management decision process to focus on performance management and then adaptation as information uh, surfaces and emerges. And we're working to try to get multiple um, and enhanced monitoring that goes along with that because, of course, adaptive management is worth nothing unless you have the metrics and the monitoring. On the partnership building and the participation, We've come out with an environmental statement men, uh, memoranda that I alluded to on consensus-based decision-making in which we basically say, look, if there are communities, and Lois Schiffer rightly pointed out to me, and I fully agree with her, that communities are both communities of place as well as communities of interest. And so when I say consensus-based decision-making, I don't mean just, you know, the people that are located in one five-square-acre place. I mean national organizations and others who have an interest in that management of that place. We said if you come out with, if there's a community of interest in place who come out with a consensus alternative for managing lands, something akin to what we've achieved at the Sonoita Planning Partnership in Las Cienegas uh, in Arizona. If you come out with a land management plan, and in that instance it's actually across federal lands, county lands, uh, state school lands, as well as some private lands, um, we will take that and import that into the NEPA scoping process so that the rest of the public and the entire nation can comment on that option uh, as, and, and potentially advance it as the preferred alternative. We think that that is a way of substantially enhancing the meaningfulness of participation by the citizenry in these important decisions. I think that counts for a lot We'll see where it goes. We'll see how, how much it does help uh, the participatory efforts of American citizenry to, to flourish. Uh, thank you very much to both of our speakers. We're going to take a break until about 10 after, in which time we'll start our second panel. But let's not leave before uh, joining me in thanking uh, our two guests today. Thank you.